Um, all right, uh, what I want to talk about is a little, a little bit of my adventures in starting to pay attention to neuroscience and what neuroscience has to bear on sort of the questions that have been coming up uh, this week. Um, as sort of a teaser for the end of the talk, uh, the video that I'm playing here um, is a computer simulation that we put together. Uh, it is currently the world's first large and largest and still only um, simulation of the brain where the individual components are vaguely biologically realistic uh, neurons um, that's capable of performing uh, a task. Uh, and the particular task that it's doing here is a relatively challenging task. It's being given a sequence of numbers and it's being asked what comes next. Uh, it's never seen the sequence before. All of its input is through some sort of visual input here. It's got to have a, it's got to go through the eye. It's got to go through the visual system. It's got to go through some sort of executive memory. It's got to do some sort of um, decision about what to do next. It's got to do some internal reasoning and eventually it's got to move its arm, send commands out to its muscles and move its hand and give an answer. Um, and most of us looking at them, I'm just also showing the pattern that it's being shown down here so that we can also do the task. And most people here will fill in the blank there pretty easily. Um, and so will this neural system. Um, and we were kind of excited that it was even possible to build this thing. Uh, Ten years ago, when I was um, just starting this task, I would have said that, look, we we don't even know how to go ahead. How would you go ahead and build something that's vaguely biologically plausible that can do a task like this? Um, and I want to talk about sort of just our adventures in going in that direction and what new things we've maybe learned. Okay. That's that. All right. So uh, this is not just me. The main professor that is running, the main principal investigator behind all this stuff is Chris Eliasmith. Um, we're at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience in the University of Waterloo. Um, there's a huge group of people behind all of this. Um, so yeah, it's big group work. For me, the core question, I'm a cognitive scientist. Um, I want to understand what are the algorithms underlying cognition? Um, what, the heck, what the heck is going on in the mind? How can we know what the mind is doing? How do we test these theories? Those sorts of standard questions. Um, and for me, the core tool that I like using um, is building computer simulations of it. Um, and in particular, I want to build, I'm particularly interested in mechanistic models of the mind, that is, models where the internal components of my computer simulation are meant to map on to things that are supposed to actually exist um, uh, in the real uh, brain. Um, and the only reason I want to say that we need a computational model, um, I mean, in theory, all of these theories, it's just math, right? I could just write out the math. And in theory, if I was an infinitely good mathematician, I could just derive what the answer would be without running the computer simulation. Um, that's not particularly possible because brains are complicated, minds are complicated, there's lots of internal systems. So we need to run a computer simulation in order to find out what the predictions of our theories are. Um, without the computer simulation, it's, it's sort of opaque to, um, if you just write down your theory, it's like, I don't know, does it predict that they'll be 5% faster in this task or 11% faster in this task? I have no idea until I've run the simulation. Um, all right, so that's justification for doing computer models. Um, and throughout my PhD, I was mostly in the ACT-R community, made a lot of sort of computational models, um, production system models of cognition. Um, and during that time, I never paid attention to the brain. All right. um, and that's a pretty common thing for um, computational cognitive modeling, where you just say, look, I'm just interested in the algorithm. All I care about is what the algorithm is behind the human cognition. I don't care how neurons happen to implement it. Like that's, that's irrelevant. I mean, this is sort of the footer point of view. Um, you know, the, that's, and you know, if, if my interest is in algorithms, why don't I just focus on the algorithms? Why would I also add in this extra constraint of, oh, and figure out how neurons happen to implement that algorithm? All right, a little bit. Um, and that was what I completely believed um, until the end of my PhD, and then I was like, oops. <laughs> um, and I think there's, if we can, if we could have, um, brain-based models as well. I think there's two main advantages. The first advantage is 
sort of the typical answer that people will give when they say, why, why would you pay attention to neuroscience? Um, look, if you've got a, uh, a theory about cognition and it predicts behavior, great. Um, but if it also predicts, you know, well, what sort of fMRI activity should you get? Or what sort of um, firing patterns would you hit in particular parts of the brain? Or what sort of timing effects should you see? If it predicts all of those things, then it's a better theory. Because it, it touches more types of data. Um, um, and that's sort of one standard story for why you might also want to pay attention to neuroscience. Um, I don't actually think this is the best reason to pay attention to neuroscience. Um, for me, the aspect that got me really excited, the aspect that made me sort of drop everything I was doing and go join uh, Chris Eliasmith's lab and go push in the direction that I am doing, um, was this is a really interesting opportunity. When, you're, when we're sitting down and we're trying to come up with the theories behind human cognition, we tend to come up with theories, we're pretty unconstrained about those theories. When we come, I mean, we've seen lots of different logics being uh, presented over the last few days. Uh, we've seen lots of different types of algorithms. There's tons and tons of algorithms out there. We tend to implement those algorithms on computers. And so I'm pretty convinced that there's a little bit of a hidden bias going on, such that we're biased towards coming up with theories that are easy to implement in traditional computers. It's a controversial statement. <laughs> um, but so many of the theories that I see, that's exactly what I mean. There's, there's sort of the if, there's, there's if and then rules, there's symbol manipulation, there's all these sorts of things going on, all these things that are very typical of computer programming. Um, the opportunity when going to neurons is if, and this is a really big if, if we can figure out what types of algorithms neurons are good at implementing, then that could direct us to look at, to think about different types of theories or, or think of theories in different ways or type, look at new types of algorithms um, that we wouldn't have stumbled across otherwise. Right? This is just sort of an odd methodological possibility. All right? um, and it was, it was this hope um, that has let me, led me in this direction for a while. There's a hand here. Yes, please. I mean, the algorithm doesn't depend on the computer, mm -hmm. it depends on the data structure, the representation of the problem. Yes. I mean, that's the important thing. How do I represent my problem, mm -hmm. right? Yes, I would completely agree. Yes. So, yes, I would, I would put that in as part of the algorithm. Yes. The, yes. Uh, in fact, the, the, the representation is going to be the core thing that I'm going to end up with as something weird here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good clarification. All right. So that's what I decided. Uh, I w basically, there was a possibility of going this di direction, and I went out on a limb and went and joined this lab that was doing something really weird, and I think we've ended up in an interesting place. We'll see whether or not I can convince you of that. All right. Um, the particular idea um, that uh, forms the foundation of everything I'm going to talk about is called the Neural Engineering Framework. Uh, Chris Smith and Charlie Anderson. Um, this book. Um, no one should read this book. Don't read this book. Um, it is, it's like an engineer tried to write a whole bunch of things, like tried to convince a neuroscientist and a psychologist of things, but only knew how to speak engineer. It's, it's anyway, it's, yeah. Um, the, the, another, there will be another book that will come up later in the talk that, you know, if people are interested in this, I think that one's a much more interesting introduction. Um, this book, if you really want to get the hardcore math underneath everything, Phenomenal, but kind of, yeah, anyway. Um, what's the basic idea? All right, basic idea is how do I, I want to figure out what neurons are good at computing. All right, so what, what, what do I mean by neuron? I mean, there's tons of possible abstractions about a neuron. Um, the underlying theory I want, uh, we're going to make sure that no matter how detailed a neuron model you want, this basic underlying theory will work. I'm going to give this as a demonstration of what does one single neuron do? Okay, so I've got one single neuron, this guy, this thing here. I've got some sort of input to it that's sort of waving up and down. Um, and this neuron um, has a bunch of internal properties. It has some internal voltage. Voltage builds up. Eventually, the voltage reaches some level, and the neuron spikes. Um, so the, it produces an output. Um, and then when the neuron produces that output, it uh, relaxes back to its default state and then builds up voltage again. That's the standard story. 
Um, and when you go and look at neurons in the real brain, so say this is a, a neuron, say it's detecting the tilt of my head. And if I, if I tilt my head all the way to the left, the neuron doesn't fire at all. If I tilt my head all the way to the right, the neuron fires a lot, and there's some sort of levels in between there. So that's, um, that's this plot here. This is saying how fast is the neuron fire given the input. Okay? And this is the input sort of wildly varying between minus one and one. This is what's going on inside the neuron, whatever, that doesn't really help much. Um, this is the individual spikes, the individual pulses of output that the neuron is producing. Um, and this is sort of, this is the act, every time the neuron produces one of these outputs, it releases a neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter is gradually reabsorbed. So this is sort of the actual output effect that the neuron has. This is just, every, every time there's a spike here, this graph goes up and then it gradually decays back down. Okay, this is sort of the high level canonical, most neuroscientists wouldn't disagree that this is sort of a first pass approximation of what a neuron does. Okay, and I'm claiming, the question I want to do is, what algorithms can I easily implement with this component? Okay. If I give this component to an engineer, the engineer goes, oh my god, this is a horrible component. I don't want to build anything out of this component. This, this input is sort of nice and clean and this, this, what? <laughs> I, 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 like, looking at this output, I can barely figure out what the input was. I just, like, how am I supposed to do anything with this component? This, this is horrendous, right? Um, and so most people just, you know, you abandon the question and you sort of say, well, neuroscience influences things somehow. Don't worry about it. Well, what if we have more than one neuron? Because we tend to have more than one neuron in the brain. All right, two neurons. Um, if we have two neurons, and I've got these neurons organized such that one of them responds to, say, tilting my head to the right, the other one responds more to tilting my head to my left. If my head's in the middle, they both kind of respond a little bit. Okay. These graphs are the same, these graphs are the same, these, these two graphs are now are the same as before. But now I've got two values. Now I've got two neurons producing output. I'm like, well, what can I do with this output? One thing I could do, if I were just randomly doing things with this, these values, I could take this one, flip it upside down, and add them together, and I can get this. And if I really squint, if I really, really squint, this looks kind of like that. No, no one's convinced. Absolutely no one's convinced. Good. All right, so, you know, it's eh, kind of, all right, what if I have four neurons? And in particular, I have four neurons, they're not all identical neurons. All right, we need this sort of variety in the neuron behavior. Okay, get that. Now I have these four lines. I'm gonna take each of these, I'm gonna multiply each of them by some number, add them up, and I can get this. It's a little bit better. Maybe, all right, let's go 50 neurons. Okay, so the only, the way, the, okay, my argument is that this thing here looks kind of like this, and ho hopefully now you're convinced. I've got a, a, some nods at the back there, that's good. Um, so the, all I'm doing is I'm saying, look, anytime I've got a bunch of neurons and they're doing, representing something together, I can get an estimate of what, they were, of what they're representing by taking their output doing a weighted sum of their output, adding it all up, and I can get this estimate. Okay, it's the only step I'm making. All right, um, and then we can do a whole bunch of interesting statements about saying, okay, well, how much information can you store in these neurons? What's their, what's their information capacity properties? You can go do a whole bunch of things on that. But this core idea of a group of neurons can work together to represent a number. So these 50 neurons, I want to be able to say, are representing that one numerical value. Um, and they're representing it in such a way that it's possible for other neurons to, take a, to make use of this information. But this group of neurons have to have the same characteristics, the same functionality, so to say. Um, I would, I want to be agnostic on that. I want to say that the group of, that the, the actual behavior, the internal behaviors of these neurons can be anything as long as they're all different. All right, so as long as these neurons all have different behavior, um, there, um, I can, by looking at the output of all of these neurons as, as an aggregate, I don't, want to just, I don't want to just average across all of them, but I can do a weighted sum, um, then I can extract the information out. Okay. All right. Turns out 
So there was a step that the math that some people, when I said do a weighted sum of these, where, where, where do I get these weights? What number do I multiply each of these by when I do this weighted sum? Um, this turns out to be a well-solved algebra problem. This is basically the problem of make a big matrix and invert it. It's what algebra was invented for. Um, so there's a, there is a very standard way, least squares minimization, to find, get me the weighted values on here, such that if I use those weights on these, I will get the best possible approximation, that this will look as close as possible to that. So, well-formed well mathematical problem. Turns out you can also use that to say, well, if I've got a group of neurons here and a group of neurons here, and I'd really like the information, so these neurons here, if I do the stuff I showed on the previous slide, I can extract out what those neurons are representing. And it's the same as what I showed on the previous slide. These neurons here, I can also extract out what they're doing. But the, instead of having this nice, so this, this sort of nice input that I was providing to these neurons, I don't have that here. Instead, what I have here is I'm saying, look, these neurons have to be driven by these neurons. Okay? The neurons have to be connected. Turns out the same math that lets me take the neural activity and decode it and see what it's being represented also lets me find a set of connection weights between these neurons such that these neurons grab whatever information was there. Okay. It's sort of a weird way of building up a neural network. So I'm just sort of, instead of doing some sort of learning algorithm or something like that, or doing some sort of randomly setting the connection weights between neurons, what I'm doing is I'm just saying, look, this is a well-formed well mathematical problem. Find me the connection weights that make this group of neurons do the best job of representing this group of neurons' information. Okay? All right, fine. I can pass information from one group of neurons to another. When I do that optimization, I can also say, well, instead of doing, find me the connection weights that do the best job of taking this information and copying it here, I can say, find me the connection weights that take this information, compute some function on it, and copy it here. So the function I've asked it to do here is please compute x squared. Take this number, compute the square of it. All right. Totally fair, fine. Interesting consequence. As far as the neurons are concerned, there's no extra effort involved in computing x squared versus just passing x around. As far as the neurons are concerned, these are just connection weights. Right? This, there's, there's no extra time involved. There's no extra um, resources involved. Um, Any time a group of neurons is passing information from one place to another, um, instead of just passing that information along, it can also modify that information. Okay. Can they do any function? <laughs> All right, so what, what's, what's the limit of things I could do here, right? Like, what if I asked it to compute, um, I don't know, I feed in um, a picture and it, the output should be, is it a dog or not? That's a function. It's a really nasty function. <laughs> it's a horrible function. Um, is that, you know, um, what, um, um, yeah, what class of functions can I do in that? Technically, any function is doable as long as you have enough neurons. So no matter how complex your function is that you want to go from one group of neurons to the next, you can always do it if you had enough neurons. It might require trillions of neurons, and so that would be bad because the human brain doesn't have that many. Um, in particular, um, the way I want to phrase it is it's... Um, in general, it's going to be good at smooth functions. So functions where a small change in the input produces a small change in the output. Um, and, uh, and it's very slightly, if you put in more complex neuron models, if you add in more, more interesting, more neural details, you can slightly change this. Um, but uh, for the vast majority of neuron models that are out there, um, the basic answer is smooth functions, small changes uh, produce small outputs or small changes in the output. Um, low degree polynomials is another way of phrasing that. X to the 10 would be bad, X squared or X times Y, that'd be fine. Um, and then there's also this fact that it's always just gonna be an approximation. It's never gonna do exactly the function you've asked it for. 
Okay. What else can I do? Um, neurons in the brain tend not to be, this group of neurons is connected to this group of neurons is connected to this group of, you know, they tend not to be feed forward. They tend to be recurrently connected. What happens if we introduce recurrent connections in this sort of framework? Well, when I make a connect group of uh, connections from this group of neurons back to itself, um, I have to make a decision as to what function it should compute on this. The same way as when I connected from here to here, I could make a decision as to what function it was computing on this. Um, and it turns out that if you do this with the identity function, it was just, you know, whatever value is currently being represented by B, please fade it back into B. Um, that turns out to implement a memory. So this is, a, so this is my input here. Um, and the idea, to, the reason I want to call this a memory is that if my input is zero, whenever my input is flat there, this pattern of activity doesn't change. Whenever my input is positive, the pattern of activity changes. It represents a more positive number. Whenever my input is negative, this pattern of activity changes. It represents a more negative number. Okay? But if my input is zero, it will stay with whatever pattern of activity it currently has. Right? That's the, whenever this is flat, this stays flat at whatever level it was at. Okay? Sort of an odd way to build um, something, well, now, now my neurons can have, uh, can store information over time. Mostly with me. No one's, all right. No one's too upset yet. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, okay, so that is the core claims from, um, from this book that um, if you're using this sort of abstraction of, of what neurons can do, You've got this core idea that groups of neurons uh, can represent numerical values. Um, I, I was just showing examples where the group of neurons are representing one value, but that extends up. You could have a group of neurons that represents two values, x, y position, um, 10 values, multi, yeah. Um, connections between groups of neurons compute functions on those values. Um, and recurrent connections let you start computing functions over time. Uh, technically, that means you can implement differential equations. Um, really, it, the only thing that's going to matter for this talk is that, yes, you can implement memory by just simply connecting a group of neurons back to itself, and they'll maintain their state over time. Um, and these models are robust to whatever neuron model you're using. They're robust to adding in noise into the system. They're robust to killing off neurons, um, all those sorts of, of uh, biological variability issues. Um, okay. Every, so everything I'm showing here is programmed by hand, so it's a model of the end point of learning. Um, we've done a whole bunch of work showing that if you have an error signal, you can learn these things. Um, but then you have to then come up with the question of, well, how are other neurons generating that error signal? And that's fascinating. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yes, for everything I'm showing here, we're modeling the end point of learning, not the entire developmental process. Okay. Um, all right, great, cool. I can go now ahead, go ahead and implement a whole bunch of algorithms. Um, if I'm interested in cognition, how is that helping me? <laughs> um, fine, if I was interested in motor control or if I was interested in um, maybe uh, some psychophysic, maybe sort of uh, reaction or, or, or visual recognition maybe or things like that, I could maybe see um, those sorts of things coming up, uh, being useful. Um, how the, it, it, but if my claim really is that what neurons are good at is representing vectors, functions on vectors, and differential equations on vectors, none of those look like symbol manipulation. But that's, uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, how, how, how do I do any of this stuff? <laughs> that seems problematic. <laughs> um, uh, the function, you know, the representation is wrong. It's not vectors of numbers. The functions certainly aren't smooth functions. They're very discrete. If this, then that. Um, uh, what? what? <laughs> so again, seems like a dead end. All right. Well, lots of people have started sort of playing around in these sorts of directions, and it's not totally extraordinarily weird to say. Um, Fine. If you want to do, if you've got something that can represent vectors, 
or you know, big sequences of numbers. Um, maybe each maybe each symbol or each concept or each idea, you know, maybe each one has its own uh, vector. So there's been some pattern of numbers that means blue, there's a different pattern of numbers that means circle, a different pattern of numbers that means square. Um, and then I could have, um, I could have a group of neurons and I could feed in the pattern for blue and it could store that. I could feed in the pattern for circle, it could store that. Um, and you know, we could at least represent symbols. It's not horribly bizarre. Um, but then of course, we hit exactly the standard binding problem. Um, and so I mean, this, this problem is, well fine, maybe you believe me that you can represent blue this way and circle this way and square this way. How the heck am I gonna represent red circle and blue square? Okay, in particular, I can't just take the pattern for blue and add it to the pattern for, red, uh, for circle, or sorry, pa the pattern for red, add it to the pattern for circle. Okay, may maybe, maybe if I add the pattern for red and the pattern for circle, I could represent red circle. Maybe I'm okay with that. But if I add, took the pattern for blue and the pattern for square and added them together, all right, fine, that would be the pattern for blue square. But if I wanna represent all of this, I can't just add all of this stuff together, red plus circle plus blue plus square, because that's gonna be the same as red plus square plus blue plus circle. I, I, I've lost all my, my structured information. I've, like, the whole point of symbol structures is to maintain the structure information, <laughs> right? I need to know what order things are in, in my, in my symbol sequences. So what am I gonna do? Uh, fortunately, I don't have to solve this problem. Other people have solved this problem. There's a small little community of people um, who are looking into what they call vector symbolic architectures. Uh, Ross Gaylor um, has a nice little sort of overview, a little six page paper saying, hey look, this solves the binding problem. Um, and, uh, and the rest of Jack and Dove's problems. Um, uh, and the idea is, well look, if you have patterns of numbers, you can do more than just add them. There's other things you can do. Um, and if you have some other operation, that given the pattern for red and the pattern for circle, you can do some computation on them and you get a new pattern. And the pattern for blue and the pattern for triangle, you do some computation on it, you get a new pattern, then you add those patterns together. And that's gonna maintain your information. And this is gonna work fine as long as uh, whatever this operation is, um, you have some sort of, uh, at least an approximate inverse of this operation. Because you wanna be able to extract the information out afterwards. Um, so there's lots of different options as to what one you use. Um, we go with uh, Tony Plate's suggestion of using a mathematical operation called circular convolution. Um, basically, the only reason for picking that one out of the lots of others that are available is that it turns out neurons are incredibly good at implementing that function. Um, it's the function they're best at right after addition. <laughs> um, so uh, that seems promising. Okay. Um, Let's sort of vaguely demonstrate this. What I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show in this video um, is a group of neurons. Over here, I'm feeding in the pattern for red and the pattern for circle. These neurons are computing that wacky operation and putting the output here. All right, so this neuron, or this group of neurons will, let me reset that again. I'm feeding in red circle. This group of neurons is coming pretty close to the pattern for circle and red. I then feed in blue square. And now this, the pattern that's in here is now kind of similar to circle red and it's also kind of similar to blue and square. Uh, by kind of similar, I mean uh, mathematical dot product, but just the similarity between patterns is sufficient. All right, this group of neurons is connected back to itself. So that means it's gonna remember its pattern over time. So that's why when I fed in, so I fed in red circle, this is now storing the pattern for circle in red. I'm now gonna feed in blue square. This is gonna now store both of those patterns. I'm now gonna take away that input. And now it's still got the information about its red circle and blue square. Now I'm gonna query my memory. So now I'm gonna feed in, what am I gonna feed in? I'm gonna feed in circle, I get out the pattern for red. I feed in square, I get out the pattern for blue, kind of fading away, the memory's fading away. All right, so this is just demonstrating that, we, that it's possible to get neurons to do the math I just described. Okay, using, this, using exactly the tricks I was showing in the, the initial videos. 
vaguely believe me. <laughs> All right. So I can take symbols, I can bind them together, I can combine them into one representation, um, and I can extract things out of that representation. And it's not perfect. You know, this, you know, what I'm, the, the, the darkness, the, the, the size of the number is just how similar it is to the, to the ideal pattern. Um, and the darkness is also how similar it is to the ideal pattern. And you can see it's kind of noisy. It's like it was, there was a period of time in there where it was halfway between blue and circle. Um, it's, it's not perfect. Um, maybe it's good enough. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, um, and, I, and I will sort of, as a caveat here, we're forced into this weird representation just because we haven't been able to come up with any other way of dealing with the binding problem um, that, that is um, anywhere close to as efficient as this. So, I mean, that's the, really, that's the strongest argument I have for this particular method is just that, well, I, I can use this method to do things and other methods people have proposed require orders of magnitude more neurons than this method. So, I don't know. It's a, it's a weak argument, but it's a, at least an existence proof. Okay, but what, what do we have here? This is not a classical symbol system. Right? That combined representation, I cannot look at that combined pattern and see its, con its constituents. Okay? Um, I can combine lots of things together. I can combine lots of things together. I can just sort of add and add and add and add. But when, I come, when it comes time to extract information back out, the accuracy gradually decays. You know, it's sort of, well, if I've added in 10 things, maybe I'm slightly uh, less, going to be less accurate in recovering things. Um, I can also nest structures inside structures. Um, so, so you can use this to represent trees. Um, and again, accuracy gradually decays um, a little bit more quickly. The deeper you go in the tree, um, going deep, deeper in a tree is much worse than going um, broad in a tree. Um, I can extract out this information. Importantly, extracting out this information requires work. If I have one of these combined patterns, if I have this sort of combined pattern that's representing circle, red circle and blue square, I need to do something to it in order to get out those elements. And doing something to it is going to require time. Okay, it's going to require effort. It's going to require moving things to other groups of neurons. Uh, because neurons don't communicate instantaneously, um, there's operations that need to be involved there. Um, and we can treat symbols as sort of vaguely atomic um, uh, classic symbols, but not quite. They can also have similarity information. So for instance, if, I, if my pattern for red was vaguely similar to the pattern for pink, then as a consequence, it's going to turn out that the pattern for red circle is going to be similar to the pattern for pink circle. So there's some sort of similarity information maintained in this larger structure. It's going to end up being important at the very end of the talk. Okay. So we've got something that's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not a full symbol system. <laughs> It's, it's got different characteristics. What can we do with this thing? Um, so uh, this is the book where we basically say, all right, what can we do with these things? And we just start randomly building stuff with these components. Um, the terminology that's sort of coalesced around this is we've been calling these things semantic pointers, and we've been calling this whole structure the semantic pointer architecture. Um, the, the, the core idea here is we've been trying to build up a collection of, of components that are good at manipulating these sorts of representations, and we can sort of find out um, uh, what they can do and try to build up cognitive tasks with them. Um, so some examples. So the first example that I basically got talked into doing immediately, because all right, I've got something that's vaguely like a symbol system. Let's prove it's a symbol system. Let's prove I can do something symbol system-like. Let's do the Tower of Hanoi task, because you sort of have to, all right? There's all sorts of standard models of the Tower of Hanoi, how people solve the Tower of Hanoi task with a bunch of if-then rules. Um, and so you can set it up as sort of a classic production system if you're in this, you know, if, so this is, the, the blue thing is, I'm, uh, I'm currently attending to the red thing. My, my goal is currently to move the blue disk over here. Um, and, you know, if, if I'm trying to move this here, look at this disk, and if it's not in the way, then it's all okay to move this disk. There's, this whole, there's a whole sequence of if-then rules that people have, are relatively confident that humans, uh, expert humans in this task are doing. 
Um, I can use groups of neurons to represent the pattern for looking at disk one and the pattern for having a goal of moving uh, disk two. Um, we just randomly generate these patterns. These ones are not grounded in any way. Um, and it turns out that if you want to implement a, something like a bunch of if-then rules, you end up building something that looks a heck of a lot like a basal ganglia, um, which keeps some of the neuroscientists happy. Um, so you get something like a bunch of if-then rules. So these groups of neurons here are responsible for figuring out which rule is, should be applied in my current situation. Um, and then these are the neurons that are sort of representing the particular rule that's currently active. All right, so you know, rule three is currently active. Rule five is currently active. Um, and those rules, in turn, go ahead and modify what's going on um, here, which we could maybe vaguely call cortex. All right, so a bunch of neurons representing my state information, neurons representing um, trying to figure out uh, what thing that I know how to do is most relevant in my current situation, and then neurons responsible for uh, implementing the, the you know, if, you, if you have these if-then rules, this is sort of doing the if part, and these are sort of doing the then part. So you can take a standard production system and put it all together, um, and you can build something that at least means neurons using this really fuzzy, weird representation can at least do this task. All right, fine. It's kind of nice is that you can start getting timing predictions out of this sort of model. You can sort of say, well, you know, is it t you know, so people, when they do this task, there's these big, long pauses at certain situations. Do we get those big, long pauses? Um, and those are sort of indicative of there's a bunch of internal steps that people have to do. Um, and, and so we can do sort of those sorts of comparisons. Um, we can also go on and start saying, well, uh, what about other sorts of tasks? Let's do, here's a list memory task. Um, similar idea, I'm just sort of showing it a bunch of, of, of input. It has to build up an internal representation of the sequence, um, and then it has to try to repeat things back out, and there's it sort of missed one of the numbers. It missed one of the numbers in the middle. So you can actually find primacy and recency effects in this sort of model, which is kind of nice. Um, so I mean, the, the, the hope that we have when building these things is we can sort of say, well, let's build the, you know, here's the ideal task. Um, and then does the approximate, the neurons are only approximating whatever function I've asked it to do. Um, maybe those approximations end up um, matching human behavior. And in this one, it's at least vaguely indicative, maybe. Um, so that is kind of nice. We can do those sorts of things with this. Um, let's also show that we can do sort of mental arithmetic. This is four plus three, and you can sort of peek inside its brain at the top there, and you can sort of see it count four plus three, five, six, seven, and right out the seven. So, you know, we can do sort of standard, I mean, mostly we're just kind of excited. Yay, we can actually get neurons to do something vaguely symbolic like this. Um, but so far, oh, sorry, I forgot that I added in the waste and task example because we've seen the waste and task so many times here. We have to do the waste and task. <laughs> um, uh, fine, yeah, so, so you can, we, can, we can train it, so we, can, we can hard code it such that it says, all right, if you're given the abstract version of the task, so this is how we would represent the rule that we're given. We're saying, all right, there's some pattern that is consequent times even plus antecedent times vowel relation implies. That's how we would represent the rule. Um, and then we could build a function that says, all right, given this rule, what cards do you flip over? What things do you attend to? Um, and then we could even have it that it not only has this rule, but also has a context. Um, and then we could set up that function such that in the abstract context, it does one thing. And in the um, sort of uh, facilitated or sort of real work concrete situations, it'll do, uh, it'll do a different thing. Um, the exciting thing that I really liked out of this one is when we, we tried training it on, we, we, we built the model only to handle the uh, drinking and voting conditions. So these are both, conc these are both sort of uh, concrete situations where, you know, if you're drinking, you have to be not over uh, 20. Uh, if you're drinking, you have to be over 21. If you're voting, you have to be over 18. We trained it up on those. We optimized the network to do those ones, but then we fed it a, um, uh, a rule that it had never seen before. And the rule it had never seen before is if, is, you know, if you're over 16, or if you're driving, you have to be over 16. Um, and its outputs were that, yes, you have to be driving or not over 16. So it was able, it's able to generalize across that structure, um, which is a little bit exciting. 
Okay. Um, all of those examples, they're kind of nifty that I can implement them in neurons. Um, and it's nice to be able to match to the biological data and sort of say, what, I mean, there's relatively little spiking data for human cognition tasks, but you know, we, we can at least look at timing data, we can look at things like that. Um, and so it's, I think I could argue, at least for some of those things, that it's more than just a mere implementation, you know, that we're getting something out of the fact that we've implemented in neurons. Um, but what I would prefer is something a little bit stronger. What I would really like is an example where being forced into this wacky, strange, weird style of, rep of representing things um, gives me some sort of new capabilities. That, that, that would be exciting to me. Um, are there things that these systems can do that are difficult to do with classical symbol systems? Um, and here's what I think is our, probably our, our only exa example of this, <laughs> um, but it's hopefully it's, um, this is the video I was showing at the beginning. Um, so what's going on here? What it's got to do, it's being given these sequence of symbols, it's got to figure out what comes next. We can sort of be okay with what I've said so far about how we could maybe represent these numbers. If I want to represent 111, I could maybe be convinced to say, okay, there's some way of representing one, there's some way of representing position one, and I could say there's a one in position one, plus there's a one in position two, plus there's a one in position three. And that would give me a pattern that means 111. You know, so at least, at least there's a way for the system to represent a sequence of numbers it's never seen before. That's, that's not horrible. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe we've got a bunch of these. And maybe you can be vaguely convinced that there's some way of, I'm sequentially showing these individual numbers to the system, and it's got to do the math, it's got to build up the representation, it's got to actually um, combine all these things in order to compute this one, one, one vector. You know, maybe you can be convinced to do that. Um, but this whole extra step of, well, what comes next seems weird. How, and how, I mean, how, even how would you do this in a standard classical symbol system? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult task. People, most people's computational models of this task um, have basically, basically end up being, here's a whole bunch of different patterns that I'm looking for, um, check to see if it's one of those patterns, um, which seems unsatisfying. So how do we do this task? given that you're forced into this weird mathematical framework. All right. So this is basically what I said before, that you know, we at least have ways of representing these things. So square one, I could represent as the pattern for one bound to the pattern for position one, and that whole resulting thing is just a pattern. Okay. Square two is one, position one, plus one. Okay, that whole thing is another pattern. Square three, another pattern, another pattern, another pattern. We can maybe build those all up. What can I now do with these patterns that I couldn't just do with symbol manipulation? Well, I can compute what pattern would take me from here to here. What could I bind to this thing that would give me this? So that is, give me the pattern that is the mapping from this sequence to this sequence. Okay, that's, that'd be hard to write out in symbol forms, but in, ter in terms, since all these patterns this is just vectors, this is just math, right? It's just that uh, there's some numerical answer to that. Have, I don't know if it doesn't have any interesting meaning. But I can also compute, okay, what's the pattern that takes me from this one to this one? What's the pattern that takes me from four to five, five to six, seven to eight? I can get all these patterns. So each of these patterns, so these are the patterns that are the transformation from one symbol structure to the next, kind of. But they're also just patterns. How do I, what do I, how are you just gonna take the average of those patterns? All right, what the heck am I, in, in terms of symbol manipulation, I have no idea what this operation is doing. Uh, what? <laughs> All right, but I can get something, it's just another vector. I can take that thing, I can bind it to my last one, and I get, approximately the right, this should not be an equal sign, this should be approximately. Yeah, that I get approximately the right answer. And it's closer to the right answer than anything else. That's a weird operation. That's a really strange operation. <laughs> um, and uh, turns out to 
you know, do, these, uh, do the whole family, not the whole family, a big chunk of the Ravens matrices tasks um, in a way that is very surprising to symbol manipulation um, and turns out to be extremely efficient and quick to implement uh, in neurons. Weird, okay? There's at least some people nodding during that, so I'm sort of feeling, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, the main thing, okay, so take home message. Um, it is possible to build neural models of, of reasoning type operators, symbol-like manipulation. They're all symbol-like. They're never perfect symbol systems, um, or at least not with the approach that I'm using. Um, you get some weird aspects, like you need time to extract information. Um, that has implications for things like uh, shallow and deep semantics that I think Paul Thagard will chat about tomorrow. Um, the, uh, you get all sorts of weird, as you gradually combine things in, you get this gradual decay of, uh, of accuracy. Um, and I think I would end up arguing that the sorts of computations that, I was, that, I, that happened here, this sort of, you know, find me the right find me something to fill in the blank there. Um, I think I would argue this is very much in line with some of the System 1 stuff um, that's being, that was being uh, talked about over the last few days. Because there, was, there really isn't any sort of internal access to, um, to the, the content of these things. Um, it's, I think I would more ex uh, describe this as, well, if you just train up the system, you're going to get interesting, useful predictions. Um, are interesting, useful uh, guesses as to the right answer, um, which feels very much in line to me with sort of system one type things. Um, and then the sort of stuff that I showed with the Tower of Hanoi or the explicit counting structures um, feel much closer to me as sort of more system two things. And so one of our big strategies is can we start building up larger and larger models that combine these sorts of things? Um, anyway, uh, so it's possible to build these models if people are interested in doing it. Um, it's at least not hopeless, and 10 years ago I would have said it was hopeless. Um, and then it is possible, to, once you've got these models, you can start making quantitative predictions about error rates, firing patterns, reaction times, and things like that. Uh, reaction times are particularly exciting to me because in most of these models, um, the timing is uh, not a free parameter. The neuroscientists tell you how fast those neurotransmitters are, and so you've got no choice. It's like, okay, it's, that's how fast it is. It's not a free parameter. I can't adjust anything. Um, is this actually how the brain does things? Really, the, the strongest argument I would make right now is it's hard to find alternatives that can go this far. Um, but I think the strongest argument for me is this sort of weird vector operation is much more natural to implement in neurons uh, than uh, standard uh, logical things. Um, cool. Um, if people are interested in more, uh, this is the book that's at least mostly accessible. It talks about this sort of thing. We also have a software toolkit specifically for if you have algorithms and you want to try to implement them and just have it automatically generate the neural models for you and do all the wacky math, um, there's a software toolkit to do that. Um, and we just finished uh, a summer school in Waterloo, a two-week summer school where people just built these things. Thank you very much. <laughs>